Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Thanks for joining me. Uh, great. Looking forward to a uh, in-depth and fascinating discussion with uh, a guy I've admired for a long time, maybe you as well, Howard Vincent. He's the chief executive at Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. That's just a part of his job. He's got so much else going on, and unfortunately, not for very much longer. But we do have him with us today to talk about the accomplishments, the challenges of running, uh, the well, the biggest upland conservation group in the country. So if you have a question, I hope that it's on my list and I can ask it for you. That's our goal today here on the Upland Nation podcast. A few other things as well, so stick around. If you've got a favorite dog name, you probably shared it. I'll tell you, the most popular post on social media has 390 comments, and we're going to go through some of those and maybe give you an idea or two about your next dog name. And then if you're looking for Gamble's Quail, we've got a public access hotspot for you, so stick around. It's all coming up on the Upland Nation podcast. Well, how's your training going? Maybe you're doing some shooting practice. I'm doing both around here, thanks in large part to the lessons I took while we were over at Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School a couple weeks ago. Still getting together on that stuff. Rigged up a fascinating little device that I think is helping me. You know those oscillating fans you can put on the floor? and Well, I use one for my workouts, but I... I taped, I duct taped a flashlight to it. So when it oscillates, I get this light on the wall going back and forth, you know, kind of like a crossing pheasant. And so I'm doing my gun mounts with that in mind, better than a stationary target because you're always moving. And remember, move, mount, shoot is how a lot of instructors, including Vandy Fiedler over at Mid Valley, get us to mount correctly and actually shoot at the right point in the bird's kind of motion, if you will. Working for me so far, I guess I'll have a full report once bird season starts, but maybe you're doing the same or maybe you're working on something with your dog. Steadiness training still top of mind here as well. It looks like for you too. Okay, Uh, you know, the Upland Nation podcast is made possible by Roughland Performance Kennels. Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and our good friends at Trulock Choke Tubes. So I just uh, sent off a uh, magazine article on uh, Gamble's Quail, and... uh, well, I didn't write about this particular place. I did use a lot of the knowledge I gained while visiting it, uh, as well as the places I did write about. Deming, New Mexico is one of those gambles, quail hot spots. It doesn't get near the attention it should, and granted, you, you know, you're going to get a little more now, but it's not going to hurt it. There's so many acres of BLM land out there, Bureau of Land Management, federal property open to hunting you got to be a little careful about access because there's some wilderness areas right there and the roads are closed there but you can get right in on the edge and then walk from there or just hunt the bureau of land management property on the other side of the gate deming new mexico is one of those well actually you want to watch a a gamble's quail hunt Uh, we got some scaled quail as well so um, it worked off uh, both of those birds uh, the Wing Shooting USA episode is on YouTube, so check it out there. They uh, run the dry creek beds on the western slopes of most of those mountain ranges out there. If you find water, that's where you're going to find birds, especially early in the day. The biggest covey of scaled quail I ever saw was at a windmill stock pond. You know, the windmills pull that water up. They put it into that giant, those giant tanks. Um... Worked pretty well for us that time. It's a run-and-gun kind of operation. You're not going to get the prettiest dog work, but you will get some points once in a while. So check it all out. It's near Deming, New Mexico. The Gila Mountains uh, are a good place to start. All the BLM land around Deming is certainly worth a look. Take plenty of water, and maybe I'll see you there. 
So speaking of shooting, um, one of the things that uh, I'm working really carefully at right now is my move mount shoot, and maybe you are too. If you want to bring your group together and do some of that, uh, you might want to consider stopping by Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School. They're in western Oregon near the Salem metro area, and so it's convenient right off Highway 5, easy to get to, lots of clay target games. Bring out a group, whether, well, the last time we were there, we were followed by and preceded by corporate groups, guys out for a good time instead of working on a Friday afternoon. Yeah, it was a little shoot, you know, party with guns. And what's wrong with that? You want to have your own party with guns, whether it's a bachelorette or a bachelor party or anything else? Safety first, of course. But you got to start somewhere, and you can start at midvalleyclays.com. And uh, once your shooting skills are developed to the point that you are happy, you might want to head out to Huron, South Dakota, Ringneck Nation. You get a free information packet. Yeah, all the useful hard copy stuff will be mailed to you free of charge. Just go to huntheronsd.com and scroll down and ask them to send it to you. They've got the Ringneck Festival and Bird Dog Challenge if you like a little bit of friendly competition. More importantly than anything else, and that's why we're going there, 124,000 acres of public access within an hour of downtown. And downtown has everything you need as well. So check it all out. Join me for the Fur Feathers Friends event out there or just go on your own, hunthuronsd.com. You know, I, I was telling him off, Mike, I'm a little embarrassed. We haven't had an in-depth discussion like this in a long time, let alone here on the Upland Nation podcast, but um, it's about dang time. Howard Vincent, President and CEO of Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Scott. You know, we, we you know, I pull on your coat every year at Pheasant Fest about something or other, and, and you're kind enough to listen to me. Last time around, you invited me to crash one of your parties, and I do appreciate that. But, you know, that's just the kind of guy you are. You're always looking out for everybody in that organization, and the organization is looking out for all sorts of other things that are important to bird hunters and bird dog owners. Um we're going to talk in large part about, you know, kind of looking in the rearview mirror. You are um, going to be retiring, uh, not anytime soon, but soon enough in the grand scheme of things. So with that in mind, tell me, uh, tell me, let's bring everybody up to speed on pheasants forever and quail forever. Let's just talk about that first. Yeah, well, um, last Friday was our actually our 40th anniversary. And so for 40 years, we've stayed focused on who we are, which is a habitat organization. So from day one, you know, we were focused on pheasants. Uh, we also recognized as a habitat organization that we impact more than just pheasants. Yeah. And so um, in uh, maybe the first five or six years, we added to the mission statement pheasants and other wildlife. And then, you know, at about year 25, uh, we also added quail forever uh, to the geography and to driving that mission uh, in quail space. And that's quail, obviously, from the southeast uh, all the way out to the west coast and up, you know, into, you know, California quail and valley quail range as well. And so... Um, that's kind of who we are. We, we understand exactly what our strength is and what our purpose is, and we've stayed focused on that. And, and then beyond that, we continue to recognize the benefits beyond uh, wildlife. And it, you start looking at water quality and soil health, monarchs and pollinators, and even at this moment, carbon uh, sequestration across the grasslands. So, um, and this is who we are 40 years later and kind of more of the same coming. 
You know, um, Howard, I, I, I really respect your organization and, and your leadership, and, and I mean volunteer leadership as well as the professionals in, in uh, Minnesota and elsewhere. One of the things that I've always been impressed with, and I, I used to work in politics and, and pretty deep in that world, and what I've seen uh, PF and QF do over the years is, is kind of um, uh, utilize uh, – the priorities of the world, if you will, uh, to further the priorities of our organization. Um, you mentioned pollinators, and I'll never forget uh, getting up one morning really early to leave Pheasant Fest at the end of the uh, organization's meeting. And I shared a cab with a gal, and I said, what, what were you doing there? She said, oh, well, we're with, we're with the butterflies and, yes. and, and and this was before most people got it. And I said, "What the heck are you doing at Pheasants for at Pheasant Fest?" And she gave me the you know the quick version of what you guys are doing uh, more and more and more and more. And and it leads me to this idea that you you say habitat organization, um, which I I get it. But explain why you don't say our job is to make more pheasants um, instead. Why don't you, why don't you yeah. explain the difference? Well, I think the difference is actually quality of the habitat that we're delivering across the landscape. Um, so if we narrowed our vision, and, and, and make no mistake, you know, from the, the very first day, um, it was all about pheasants, right? I mean, we started here in Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, a result of uh, kind of the energy derived from a article that Dennis Anderson at that time was writing for the St. Paul Planner Press lamenting uh, the decline of pheasants in Minnesota and what could be done and creating that chapter model of volunteers putting on banquets and our unique uh, system that the dollars would stay local within those chapters. That's where the mission would get delivered and absolutely it was all about pheasants but as we recognize more partners as we brought others uh into those relationships helping them deliver their mission whether that was um the natural resource conservation service part of the department of ag or you know in later years uh monarchs and pollinators the same thing that a baby pheasant needs because they only eat bugs in the first 20 days of their lives and in order to produce bugs you need native prairie and uh forbs wildflowers that create these little bugs so the same things that pollinators need flowering uh wildflowers the same thing that baby chicks need so connecting those dots quickly building a bigger tent mm -hmm. building uh let's let's use the, let's let's stay with uh theory cross-pollinating <laughs> more groups, more individuals, more organizations, more agencies, federal and state. And, you know, we leap to, you know, to our year ends June 30th. And so 2021 and 2022, we're delivering 2.2 million acres last year, uh, which is a record for us. It's a, that's what we did annually. And, we do almost nothing by ourselves. Yeah. Every one of those acres has multiple partners engaged. Um, the base of our organization is our volunteer chapters, leaders out there, uh, along with our members who are avid pheasant and quail hunters. And then the reality of the impact that we're having on this landscape, we're well beyond the hunting community. Now, again, we understand our volunteers are avid hunters, but the work that's happening, let's let's stay in that pollinator space and expand into water quality. Um, those are people who may not be interested in hunting or the shooting sports, but they understand the impact that we're having and the work we're doing on this landscape. Um, and, and they're engaged. Does, so, that, ever, does that ever uh, create a... Uh, a socially awkward situation we're we're on the ground getting our dirt under our fingernails and the guy next to us is a audubon society member or he's uh, whatever he is uh, d 
do, have they already kind of figured it out that, uh, you know, hey, we, we are allies, you know, uh, you make strange bedfellows, but we're all aiming at the same thing? Yes, and, and it's, but it takes a moment. Um, yeah. and here's an anecdotal story, and this is, this is a true story, but, and it, but it's a one-off. Mm. Um, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, we are new into uh, the pollinator space, and we're at a conference, and one of our key people is uh, doing a presentation with the Xerxes Society. That's, uh, there's like, they oh, have like butterfly um, people. Yeah, mostly actually bees, okay. right? Honey bees. All right, all right. So whether it's whether it's a, a mom and a dad in the backyard as a hobby, or whether it's the industrial honey producers, um, you recognize that all the honey bees that they use for pollination in California, whether it's almonds or fruit or otherwise, are all shipped in yeah. on sixteen yeah. flatbeds, right? So all of the pollinators are brought in for the season. For the for the pollination season, and they move north into the fruit country up in Oregon and Washington. Okay, so we're at a major conference there. We give our talk, uh, round of applause at the end of it. Except an older woman stands up at the end and screams. <laughs> Pheasants Forever is a hunting organization, and I'm anti-hunting. I sent my membership in this morning because nobody does more for pollinators and monarchs and pheasants forever. And then she sat down. And you can imagine at that moment, the, you know, this whole room after listening to what we do and to have someone stand up and you think they're going to pull a pin on a grenade, right? <laughs> yeah, I was I'm waiting anti for that. Anti-hunting, yeah. yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. And then putting the pin back in and say, but. I recognize, you know, at the end of the day, what they do, and I'm all in. I love it. And I'm a member. And so that has to happen. That conversation has to happen. And, and I've seen it really change the dynamics across, um, let's say, five other industries in the last, and I'll even know, five years. Yeah. Right? So, again, you know, our hunting community, our conservation community is core and then we start working with commodity groups, right? This is big agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it started with the Iowa Soybean Association. Their job is to sell soybeans and create markets, right? They don't really historically, I would say, represent, and that, there's a learning curve for me here too, Yeah, that they represented the farmer. They don't. They represent their commodity, soybean. And then the South Dakota corn growers. And what happened over the last three to five years is we now are across the table. Um, we've been kind of arch enemy, number one, yeah. because we're trying to add the Conservation Reserve Program into a landscape, taking acres out of production for corn and soybeans, which means that those commodity trade groups don't get their nickel per bushel. And my ignorant view was they didn't care where it came from as long as it came. Yeah. Didn't care if it was efficient farming, whether the producer was making money or not. We then got two or three feet away from each other to have these kind of hard conversations. And I would like to say I brought them all the way over to my side of the fence. And in reality, we met in the middle. Um, I came to learn that they did care about their producers. They did care about sustainability of their industry. They were concerned about water and soil health. Um, and what we came to the middle on was just that. Here's the things we can agree on. We may not agree on, and we don't, you know, 20 or 30 percent of the issues and that maybe relates to farm bill or crop insurance or how many acres should be in a program uh what are the economic drivers of that but at the end of the day they believe in sustainability and water quality and soil health uh and so that's where we're now working together and at this moment we have um like three of the largest commodity groups who are actually helping us fund precision egg positions on the ground in the national corn growers, wow. uh, the sorghum checkoff and cotton ink. 
And so these are, this is their national job to create markets and open up, but um, we're working with them every single day uh, to drive sustainability and precision ag uh, for their producers. So, and, that, and that's just in the ag industry. Now you go to right-of-ways and you go highways, energy corridors. Um, there's more opportunity in that space right now than there is even in farm bill. So All and right, yeah. C- the CRP right now, the ceiling is 27 million acres. Um, we think right-of-way has 35 to 40 million acres of opportunity um, underneath solar farms, um, the sustainability in corporate America. Um, Coca-Cola wants to know that their corn syrup uh, coming off those farms is grown sustainably. And what does that mean? So we're working with any number of different uh, organizations. Uh, and, and then again, let's go back to uh, carbon sequestration right now and the importance of that uh, globally. And this is work that we do every single day. Um, there's nothing better to sequester carbon than grasslands and native prairies, right? Yeah. The, yeah. the magic of a, and sometimes we're put at odds and, and, and we don't look at it that way, but trees sequester carbon, except that carbon's above ground. Huh. And, and given a fire, and we're living in that space right now, these devastating fires, um, all that carbon's released. Where in a prairie or grasslands, um, you have, even if you have a fire, a minimal amount of that grass uh, burns is above surface where you have grass that's two, three feet high. It's got 12 to 15 feet of root systems. That's where the carbon is stored and kept. Mm -hmm. So even in a fire situation, that carbon remains stored. Um, And it's all of these things kind of add up and stack up into the benefits of what we think can drive uh, wildlife habitat and get the benefits across multiple. Yeah. uh, And again, and that's my view of, you know, this is well outside the hunting community in decisions and yet, the hunting community is benefiting by this because of the diverse wildlife in that space uh, and, and non-hunting species as well. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you, you know, one thing that jumps to mind, by the way, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, the host. That's Howard Vincent, the president and CEO of Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. What, what you're talking about is making, uh, for lack of a better term, wildlife habitat conservation relevant to other constituencies of one sort or another by by creating that common ground and it's just mind-boggling to see those kind of successes in that area you know as you look back and nobody ever completely leaves pheasants forever you know who i mean when i'm talking about that guy named joe um (laughs) he's he still shows up like a bad penny all the time and and you will too what are what are the things that you think are going to take place in the next couple of years after you have retired that that will further that mission? Yeah, you know, it, it, so I'm going to turn the question a little bit. I think in the um, the most common question I'm getting right now as an organization is, did, could you ever have imagined? So I'm uh, the organization had, like I said, had its 40th birthday. Um, I became a volunteer and did some pro bono work uh, at about year two of the organization yeah. just as a volunteer. Yeah. And and then in 87, I came on as our first director of finance. And so I've been an employee for about 36 years. And that common question, did you ever imagine you could be? So last year we set a record in revenues. We broke $100 million as an organization. And most importantly, we set a record in Uh, acres delivered, 2.2 million acres in one year. Um, And I can honestly look back and go, no, never. You know, when I think I came, I think we were about a, you know, about a hundred or $500,000 organization. Did I imagine we'd be, you know, a million? Well, yes, 5 million. Yeah, maybe 10 million, Uh, probably not. Uh, And then now that we're broke a hundred million, now I can imagine who we can be. Yeah, yeah. And we can be 
a $500 billion organization and we can deliver 3 million, 4 million, 5 million acres annually. I, I really believe that uh, the opportunities that, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, is really expanding. And I love your word and we use that a lot. Relevant yeah. is critically important. So you don't have to hunt to understand or appreciate or, or I guess at the end of the day, even be ignorant of when you turn the tap on in downtown Minneapolis or Denver or Reno, there was work being done on that landscape that gave you quality water and hopefully quantity of water. So, I mean, in that realm, just in that space, we've spent the last hundred years trying to accelerate water off the land and now we're doing everything we can to slow and hold water uh, on that land, that same landscape, whether you're out in the Northwest in sagebrush uh, step or you're in uh, the South, you know, East down in the pine savannah. So um, this, is, this is relevant and the uh, partners that we've brought to the table and working together on uh, is incredible. And I only see that expanding. Um, we continually look around the room and recognize there's empty seats and who should be sitting there? Yeah. Who should we be engaging with? Um, and it, it, it is so exciting. Um, we absolutely have challenges, you know, across this landscape, but I would say we have more opportunities uh, to, to deliver more and do more and engage more constituents well i'm looking out at the sagebrush step right now wishing we did have a little bit more water but we uh we are working on that here as well locally in the meanwhile though if you're if 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 some guy just pigeonholed you in a hallway uh, walking down uh, a hotel room a ho- hallway at pheasant fest and he was just a volunteer or maybe even just a, a bird hunter and he said well what are you doing for me how would you make how would you make that relevant to him? Give uh, what what concrete example could you give to a, a guy like that? Yeah, and I and um, that, that's a great question because you know if we look at our strategic plan and and we have uh, that document that is a living document and so as little as two years ago so so we had historically we've been three enduring strategies, habitat, advocacy, right? The work in Washington, D.C. or at the States, mm-hmm. and then education and outreach. How do we bring others? Um, last year, we added access. Now, we've always looked at that as critically important and assumed everybody understood that, but we did need, we thought we needed to elevate that. And I think that's that story. So not only do we want to create more quality habitat, right? Those are two different things, quantity and quality, right? That will produce birds, but allowing the public access and creating access in that space, we think is critically important as well. And so that's all tied up in uh, what our community, not just Pheasants Forever, but the entire conservation community, hunting community, is that R3 drumbeat, right? Recruit, retain, and reactivate. So us old dogs, and I'm that perfect poster child, right? I'm 65 years old, white male. Um, We're going to time out here. We're going to time out in the next 10 to 15 years. And if we don't replicate ourselves, if we don't bring more hunters into the outdoors, if we, if our community doesn't look like the communities that we live in, the North American model of hunting is going to go away. Right. The, yeah. We know yeah. that the hunting community funds, the hunting and shooting community funds about 80 percent of all conservation across America, whether that's buying licenses, the PR, Pittman Robertson or Dingle Johnson, excise taxes that are paid on hunting and fishing equipment, that excise tax that comes back to states to do conservation. So if they're not buying licenses, if we're not buying guns, ammos, and fishing equipment and archery equipment, um, that doesn't generate excise taxes that comes back to conservation. Um, we need uh, to be more engaging, more welcoming uh, to new audiences, 
Um, and it's all tied up in the same thing. And that means access and that means quality places to hunt and fish. And that means uh, telling our story. And, you know, Scott, you've been beating this drum for a lot of years. And um, I, I, I know you appreciate and understand the importance of your messages, but um, this is a story we need to continue to tell and expand. Oh, I of, of how the mo- the North American model of hunting works, and who's driving it. So yeah, um, that's all tied up, you know, in the in the same conversation. I don't think you can separate one from the other. Uh, you can't assume habitat is enough if you don't have access to it, and it can't be enough uh, unless it's quality habitat. And there's not enough. Uh, there there'll never be enough money to do all the things we want to do. Um, but as an organization, um, you know, we look at the Conservation Reserve Program part of the Farm Bill, and we're going to be talking about the 2023 that gets uh, Farm Bill that gets uh, brought up again next year. It's every five years that Farm Bill, and that's been the greatest uh, juggernaut for conservation we've ever had. And now there's new opportunities. Pheasants Forever, we along with uh, again uh, about a, uh, another eight or nine other partners. Uh, have moved the National Grasslands Act forward. Um, it's come out of it's it's been dropped on the hill. Um, it probably won't uh, make any uh, needle move this uh, session, but we look at the next Congress uh, coming as a a pathway uh, to bring that bill forward. And that we're looking there uh, for roughly about three hundred twenty four million dollars annually. Uh, to impact grasslands and to hold grasslands. So these are great opportunities. So we're, we're, we're excited about the, the path forward. Oh, and all this macro thinking, a lot of us, including this guy, can't really get to that. We need people like you to do it. And, and uh, speaking of that sort of thing and doing it, I'm going to make a couple quick announcements while you catch your breath. Howard Vincent is the CEO and president of Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, soon to retire. In the meanwhile, we're going to get all the wisdom he has to offer there. Don't go away. We got more of Howard. And then, of course, the dog name you haven't used yet but hope to, you have 390 suggestions coming up. So stick around. First, Thank you, sageandbreaker.com, for your support over the years. Always free shipping at sageandbreaker.com. Sign up for the mailing list. You won't miss the occasional sales or the new products before everybody else hears about them. Yeah, if you have a need for anything in the gun care world, whether it's how to carry it, how to store it, how to clean it, maybe even some gunsmithing stuff, it's all available at sageandbreaker.com. Dot com, heirloom quality gear, sageandbreaker.com. And traveling this year, you might invest in the best performance dog crate you can find. You know, more dogs ride in a Roughland kennel than any other performance kennel. Learn more about all the gear they have available for you and your dog at roughlandkennels.com. A rough is just like that, R U F F. They've got everything from water storage to gear storage, uh, attachments of all sorts. I got a a fan for my dog's box and no assembly required on any of those dog boxes. More room for your dog inside. No nuts, no bolts, no attachments to fail. It's all available at roughlandkennels.com. And welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast. Howard Vincent, Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, uh, CEO and President. You know, Howard, I remember when you got involved on the quail side. I think I was there on the day you made that announcement. You, you just give us a, a just a short backstory on that because I was so grateful for it, and I think every quail hunter ought to know more about it. Well, you know, as we grew at, you know, within the pheasant range and it's, you know, the, the, you know, the first chapters were started in Minnesota 
and then kind of expanded out, you know, into the Dakotas and Nebraska, Iowa, Wisconsin, and continued on across that pheasant range. Uh, we started creeping to the edge of that northern quail range. And if you could think about, you know, that north-south line of the pheasant range uh, versus the quail range, you're into southern Nebraska, southern Iowa, uh, you know, Kansas and Missouri. And people who were driven, who, who were quail hunters. Yeah, and even the even the political forces, as we'd be in Washington D.C. fighting for a farm bill, uh, a, you know, with maybe twenty five states in that pheasant range, with those legislators, we were meeting other legislators in the quail side of that fence, saying, "How come we can't have your model? How come we can't have chapters that retain the money locally and do great things?" and that created the conversation of could we really have an impact uh, in that geography? And it, this was a conversation that was spread over a number of years. Um, we decided to go into that space, uh, use that same model. Uh, and today, you know, it is roughly in our 15th year of the Quail Forever brand. Uh, we've got pretty close to 200 chapters uh, about 20,000 members, but and in, we, I think we've got about 100 and, boy, 50 pairs of boots on the ground in the quail range proper Oh yeah, that yeah. are driving positions. And, and uh, you know, at this moment, we have about 450 employees, 350 of them are wildlife professionals. And so here's, here's a trivia piece for you at this moment. Um, we have more wildlife professionals on our staff than anyone else with maybe, and this is a maybe, the exception of the Fish and Wildlife Service. Wow. We have more wildlife professionals on the ground than maybe even the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. So more than any other state, in fact, all the states combined. Wow. Uh, and so um, this is work that's getting done across that landscape. And that's, you know, the, the effect of getting over 2 million acres accomplished in a year working. And these are working lands. Um, these aren't acres that are, you know, we're not taking farms out of production. We're taking those uh, non-positive uh, economic driving acres, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. farm the best, you know, and then let's do great wildlife on the rest is kind of that, that okay. drumbeat across all states. So that quail range, was one of the things where it really took off. In fact, our partners uh, for a working lands program with Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, the state DNR partners, uh, adding 150 new positions across that range in the last 15 years has just been incredible. Um, great work is being done. And again, more is coming. Uh, we see more opportunities uh, than, than it's scary big oh yeah you <laughs> as, know as we see it i've i've seen that of course up close and personal you've you've been involved in other species other game bird species for example other um habitat types you mentioned sagebrush step you're involved in some sage grouse work i'm afraid to guess how many other bird species but maybe you should tell us what else are you doing for folks who will never shoot a pheasant never shoot a bobwhite uh, maybe not even a valley quail or a gambles quail. What are you doing to help the rest of those guys? Yeah, and I think that comes down to the partnerships that we built within our space. And then, you know, let's, you know, the sage grouse story is just a wonderful, impossible event, right? That bird was uh, potentially going to be listed as an endangered species. Um, so many of the right partnerships, including ranchers and landowners in that 11 state region in the Northwest came together, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, the Western Governors Association, Fish and Wildlife Service, multiple NGOs uh, came together and put together a plan and went uh, forward for sage grouse. And when the uh, Secretary of the Interior made the announcement uh, at Fish and Wildlife that 
this bird was would not be listed as an endangered species. The genius of that, because that bird at that moment was the poster child of what needed, right? This iconic yeah. uh, bird as that poster child. And then when it was no longer going to be listed, the initiative changed immediately to the sage brush initiative Mm -hmm. and recognized, and this is the bigger, better story that it wasn't about just the sage grouse. It was about 350 other species in that same sage step. And that was really an impossible thing that all those groups could come together and focus on what needed to be done and just to be a part of that. So yes, we continue to have, uh, a, a sage brush initiative within our organization. There will never be a sagebrush forever or sage grouse forever. Um, <laughs> and likewise, there won't be uh, a lesser prairie chicken forever, but we're working in that initiative as well. In the Southeast, it's a working lands initiative with, uh, boy, uh, tortoises. And in the Northeast, we're working on landscapes that are, golden wing warblers and woodcock. Um, so for, for us, as long as the dollars hit the ground, the, the species impacted is somewhat irrelevant. Um, and, and so, you know, we measure our success in acres, uh, obviously quality and quantity uh, of that as well. Um, so even the statement that, you know, that is now irrelevant is to say we are trying to build a bigger tent. We don't even think about a tent anymore. This is yeah. landscape impact that we're looking across, uh, again, our uh, high uh, roadsides. How many hundreds or million miles of roads could we do something better along those sides of those roads for sure. pollinators, for monarchs, ground nesting birds, um, right? again, energy corridors for um, not just monoculture grass, which have zero wildlife benefit. Um, let's do something really impactful in that space with pollinator mixes. And, and again, diversity is the success on a landscape. Um, that's what you need. Yeah. Um, and, and what are the tools to do that? So there's fire, right? Managed fire burns, not you know, not drive-bys, not uh, forest-induced, you know, devastating fires, but controlled burns. Let's manage our resources. Uh, if you want to have healthy grasslands, they have to be disturbed. And we've taken nature out of that decision, which means now we have to go back and do that ourselves and be very conscious of that. So uh, in the Northern Plains, uh, those grasslands need to be disturbed about every five years, and whether that's interseeding, uh, disking, or fire. Uh, and then in the south, where you have, let's say, the southeast in that quail range, you have a 12-month growing season. Um, you need to disturb that about every other year. Wow. Uh, if you want to. Otherwise, it's going to turn into a monoculture, and mm-hmm. there is zero wildlife benefit. Now, you still may... Uh, build soils, you still may do great things for water, but you're um, not even from a monarch or a pollinator will you get uh, any benefits from that. Uh, uh, that's that's nature at its core, and, and we understand that and, and are trying to drive those decisions as well, whether that's um, with our partners at the state and federal agencies or on the Hill. Uh, in Washington, D.C. with the National Grasslands Act or the Farm Bill uh, and the programs that go with that. So, Well, you you said driving, and I'm going to use that analogy one more time. When you drive away from uh, from Pheasant Forever Forever and Quail Forever headquarters for the the last time as uh, CEO and president, you're looking in the rearview mirror. What is the, the what is going to be the the single accomplishment that Howard Vincent uh, pulled off that is going to have the longest lasting or the greatest impact. So I, there's nothing I've done here 
uh, I want to say personally, I, I think as an organization, um, the first 20 years of the organization, the, because the dollar stayed local, and that and the, and the local chapters delivered 100% of the mission uh, as volunteers, spectacular work. Um, we, to, to run a national organization, we were in the red 10 out of 12 months out of the year. Yeah, yeah. And, and we slowly built infrastructure, slowly. And the timing is everything, I think. And so in 2000, January 2000, I became uh, the CEO, Jeff Finden, the first CEO, retired. Um, and at that same time, some really smart people called for a meeting out in Missoula, Montana in August of 2000. And we formed what would become the American Wildlife Conservation Partners. And, and that dynamic changed, um, I, I, would, I would argue, not only Pheasants Forever's view of our role across this, these landscapes, uh, but for all those organizations, because I think prior to that, we referred to our conservation competition in that nature. So it yeah. was, I wonder what the yeah. ducks guys are doing. I wonder what elk is doing. Yeah. Well, in August of that year, the CEOs, about 20, 25 of us got together for a couple, three days, left our egos at the door and came in and said, okay, where can we work together? Um, we're going to let, again, the disagreements go away. We're going to focus on what we can move forward on. And of course, Washington DC, one of, one of those big things, um, and it changed the dynamic. It changed from, um, I wonder what the elf guys are doing to, boy, you know what? Gary Wolf thinks this, right? And, he, and we created personal connections at the leadership level that we tried to push down through our organizations. Yeah. And that, to this day, uh, we just had, you know, we just came off basically our 20th anniversary last year for AWCP, American Wildlife Conservation Partners. And so when we bring our 130,000 voices to Washington, D.C., we every week there's a letter that goes to Capitol Hill somewhere along the way on some issue in conservation. We circulate that among the top 50 organizations in the hunting, shooting, and outdoor space. And at times there's 6 million voices that are in those letters now yeah. working together. And so to me, that's one of those uh, greatest, uh, I think leaps in our conservation community that we continue uh, that continues to work very well. And we can see that continuing to expand and grow. Um, so to me that, you know, and again, that's not a, what I did some other very smart people, you know, at Boone and Crockett and Elk and Dallas Safari Club. And, you know, the fact that they were, they saw enough, they were smart enough to say, look, we got to get this, these groups together and work together and move forward. The timing, the fact that I was there and able and recognize the importance of that, um, lifting your head up uh, and recognizing that we can't do this ourselves yeah, uh, it's yeah. going to take partnerships. And, and then uh, I did learn in that same year um, in, a, in a different context, in a different meeting with a, um, the mission is more important than the brand. And that dynamic changed me both personally and professionally as how we looked at what our role was in this space. Um, and then actually, and it came out of uh, the the people who, the uh, Christine Thomas and Diane Luick actually, from Becoming an Outdoors Woman program. Sure, Bo, yeah. Um, I learned that from them, uh -huh. right? They built a, uh, this model to introduce women to the outdoors and they gave it away and they wanted people to take it and steal it and make it better. And they, you know, both still exist, but there's, there was a dozen, dozen other entities out there who mimicked that. And instead of being protective and proprietary, they celebrated that. 
Well, you, and, mean, you mentioned checking your ego at the door, and, and that there's a perfect example. But it sounds like that, you know, that's almost a daily uh, occurrence at Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. I mean, with with as many allies as you have in as many areas, you know, um, we're going to get on to the, the the fun stuff in just a moment. But one more question for you regarding your uh, retirement, and that is, whoever occupies your desk next you're going to have many conversations with that person prior to your cleaning out your office and and even afterwards i just know that's how it works uh what is the most important thing you want to tell that person boy you know um i would i would share that whatever got us to where we are at this moment today we can sure celebrate that and recognize the, the volunteers and the partnerships. And that's only interesting. <laughs> <laughs> right now, you know, so looking back, let's take 10 seconds and look back and pat ourselves on the back. And then let's take the rest of our energy and look forward. Yeah. And again, um, I think we, you know, we're working from a position of strength, I think confidence, but there's still, again, empty chairs here with companies, agencies, organizations, partnerships that should be here with us working together. And and we need to mine those opportunities. And and again, be inviting. Let's um, look for those opportunities. Don't, don't rest on, you know, just because we we did it this way last year doesn't mean that that's the way we should look or, or, or deliver it going forward. However, I did this uh, is irrelevant, right? This uh, I think we built a great team here. I, I couldn't be more proud of our national board of directors, their volunteers, um, and our leadership team here, right down, uh, you know, through the organization. We have some. The team is incredibly passionate about what they do. Um, so, you know, who else should we be working with? You know, how, yeah. where else can we be relevant? There you go. Yeah, good stuff. Now, um, uh, put on a pair of boots and a blaze orange <laughs> hat, if nothing else, because now we're going to talk about the important stuff. Um, where are you looking forward to hunting most during your retirement uh with my boys yeah <laughs> so okay so, you know hunting You're living the, yeah. the, R- the r3 dream <laughs> this is yeah the the hunting aspect of my job has never been a big part of it i mean if i got out you know three four times a year um and, and, and make no mistake i've got the best job on the planet um i love what i do but hunting wasn't a big part of it. When I do get to go, of course, I get to go to wonderful places. Uh, but we typically call it being on. Yeah. So we, yep. we it's, it's business at some level, right? We're introducing someone, uh, building partnerships, uh, relationships. Uh, and it's wonderful. And I, and I love to do it. But for me, hunting is when it's uh, myself and my two boys. And yeah. so... You know, they're adults now, they're, you know, 35 and 33, and when we go out, we try to go somewhere where no one knows who I am or what I do, and it's and it's us. And that's, to me, that's hunting, and I, I do look forward to more of that, uh, those opportunities. And so, um, yeah, I, I am looking for that. And a little more travel, maybe uh, non-business travel. Yes. So. So on a normal year, you know, pre-COVID, I, I think I was traveling about 120 days. Um, again, self-inflicted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't change a minute. And now, um, I, you know, I do enjoy travel, but we would add a little maybe more fishing on some of that, a little more hunting, uh, and enjoy that. And I, I now have uh, three grandchildren uh, over the last two years, uh, a, a two-and-a-half-year-old, and, a half year old and identical twins 
uh, girls who just have their one year. So that is quality time. And uh, myself and my wife are looking forward to more time with them. Uh, it's just the best, right? I mean, that's everyone you talk to, you know, your grandkids are special and they are, they are. So I'm, I'm looking, we're looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, we had that discussion a couple nights ago right here, and uh, yeah, yeah you, you're, you're absolutely right. For some reason, all the mistakes that parents make, the, the grandparents can make too, but they're not held accountable for them. That's right, that's right. <laughs> well, you know, you, uh, we really should have done this a long time ago, but I'm glad we did it, and I'm, I'm excited for you and, and what you've got in store for you after you uh, retire officially. But in the meanwhile, we'll all have a chance to say goodbye in person in the next few months. And uh, uh, for what you've done in the in the past and what you'll do between now and when you're, when you're escorted out, um, let me thank you for everybody who – has a dog, carries a shotgun, walks a piece of public property or even a piece of private property that's benefited from the work that you all do at Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. Everybody, uh, I think, would agree that you've you've had an incredible impact. Howard Vincent, uh, can't thank you enough, number one, for being on the Upland Nation podcast, number two, for all the work you and your team have done. Thank you, and uh, I'll give you the rest of this in person over an adult beverage sometime between now and when, <laughs> when, they, uh, when, when they officially retire you. Done deal. Scott, thank you so much for having me, and keep telling the story. I promise. Yeah, that's my promise to you and everybody else. Thanks, Howard. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, but we're not done yet. If you are searching for that classic, novel, clever, creative dog name, we'll have a few for you coming up thanks to our social media pages and an event you might consider as well, plus a sale coming up that I want to make you aware of. So let's get started. First, uh, if you're looking for a new shotgun, uh, whether it's for yourself or for somebody else, you're looking to upgrade from a pump to an auto or an auto from an auto to a over and under, LegacySports.com slash pointer is where you should start. Pointer shotguns are a work of art at a price that's a thing of beauty and they are there's some incredible fit and finish great wood it always seems to come out a a grade higher than they tell you it will and that's always a nice gift a pleasant surprise they've got everything from starter guns to youth guns to semi-automatics with a wood or a synthetic stock and then those target guns and those hunting guns of all sorts Learn more about the entire line at LegacySports.com slash pointer. And if you're looking to support, uh, well, retired bird dogs, that's what our friends at Pheasants Bonanza are doing with their camo, canine adoption and mentoring outdoors. They're holding a fundraiser. If you'd like to go, it'll be in Tecama, Nebraska in November. Get all the details at k-a-m-o-i-n-c dot org slash bird dash bounty yeah the burt county bird bounty benefits camo and a few other great causes the deadline to sign up is august 1st it's a full weekend not cheap but a great investment in retired bird dogs and finding their forever homes it's k-a-m-o-i-n-c dot org slash bird dash bounty so i couldn't resist i found a great picture of one of my earlier dogs i think that's yankee there the fluffy one on our facebook page and and um, instagram page put up a quick question name the dog name you haven't used yet but hope to someday and boy Everybody wants another dog, and maybe that's why we got 390 comments, and some of them are just clever as all get out. Now, I don't know if you're old enough to remember uh, when uh, when some of the old-time writers uh, had great names for their dogs, and uh, and 
one of the dog names that I've always wanted to use, I finally did, Flick. Um, what did you finally end up using? Well, <laughs> Mark Cross says he wants to name his next dog, Whoa. Glenn Matthews likes Scruffy. Yeah, especially if you got an ugly dog like mine. Michael Agello, why Winston? Churchill, maybe? Uh, Wayne, Wade LaRiviere says uh, Tex. Autumn is a very popular one. Axel, that sounds kind of German. Yeah, my, my sister says she wants a new dog named Lucky. That's great. I love it. Um, Harry Hill, I've always wanted to name a male badger but I'm afraid it would love it would live up to his name and excavate my yard. You know, they don't have to be a um, certain breed for that, by the way. <laughs> I have one of those right now. Um, if there's a chipmunk visible somewhere in the vicinity, Flick will go, well, you know what they call it, ape poop crazy. Scott LaPlante says, Shunka, Lakota word, word for dog. I love that. Don Keddy says chance. Absolutely. No doubt about it. What a great name. Brandon. <laughs> Let's go, Brandon, says Tom J. And Michael Salamone says Tuco. Michael, drop me a note. What is that? What's the significance of that name? T U C O. I'd love to know um, if there's a background to that. There's Kai, there's Kobe, there's Camo, there's Groot. <laughs> Lisa. Uric, uh, that's a good one. I, and I finally, I've, now I know who Groot is, by the way. Shag's a good one. Uh, Geico, says Brett Pinson. That's what he does. Okay, whatever. <laughs> oh, lots of great answers there. If you're searching for a dog name, go to the Facebook pages and check out that post right there. Thanks, everybody. And now a quick reminder from our friends and new sponsor here. True Lock Chokes. Right now is a good time to get over to truelockchokes.com and take a look at some of the sale items, plus a whole bunch of great useful information. And that's what I like about their site. You can look at some pattern papers and learn some more about why choke tubes are the best way to improve your shooting. Boom! In the blink of an eye. Receive a free case for your choke tubes when you spend 100 bucks. Free shipping on orders over 120 bucks, And a 10%, 10 discount when you get three or more chokes at the same time. So check it all out. True Lock is spelled T-R-U-L-O-C-K. Chokes.com. TrueLockChokes.com. Well, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Howard Vincent, for talking. Sure appreciate your insights. And best of luck, whatever you choose to do in the future. We will miss you as the leader of Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. Thanks especially to those who comment or leave ratings at uh, one of your podcast providers and those of you who contribute on our social media discussions. We're made possible by Roughland Performance Kennels, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and True Lock Chokes. Check out my page for the Fur Feathers Friends dot com event taking place in Huron and until then I'll probably see you at the range or on the road I'm Scott Linden thanks for listening <laughs>